Good morning. My name is Diane Moss and I will be leading the service this morning. We often remind ourselves, don't we, that uh, the church at Crofton is about people, it's not about the buildings. And this morning we are church together, not in a building, but scattered across our community in our own homes. But we are Christ's people and we are his worshipping community. The Psalms are songs and prayers and they are cries from our heart when we find it difficult to formulate our own words. And we read Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall, God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The Lord Almighty, faithfulness that none can deny. Through the storm, through the fire, there is truth that sets me free, Jesus Christ who lives in me.
Let's pray. Father, we come to you acknowledging that however fiercely the oceans roar and the mountains heave, you are God, the almighty God, and so we have no reason to fear. Father, we want to continue to pray for our brothers and sisters across the world who have been affected by COVID-19. We pray for those whose countries are being ravaged by this virus, especially those in Italy and Spain and France. And Father, we pray for that great nation of India. Lord, we pray your hand on the vulnerable in that country. Father God, be their refuge, be their strength, the one to whom they turn when their troubles are overwhelming. Father, we know there are people around us and people listening and watching right now who are afraid. People who feel vulnerable and scared. <laughs> Father, we are going through a valley right now. But we ask for your courage to hold out our hands and to put our hands in your hands. Hold our hands tightly, we pray. Lead us through this frightened valley and into fresh and beautiful living pastures on the other side. Father, we pray for those for whom this isolation is taking its toll. We pray for couples cooped up together. We pray for patience, tolerance and imagination as to how to keep occupied. And we pray for those in isolation alone for whom the days must seem particularly long and lonely. Father, be close to those on their own. Draw near in ways that might surprise them. Be their comfort during long hours that drag. Father, as we are all having to wake up to worlds that have been shaken in ways that we could possibly not have imagined, help us to use this time that we are being given to think carefully and deeply about the things that really matter. In many ways, our lives have been paired back to the basic necessities. Holy Spirit, prompt us during these times, in the coming days, to a, pre a fresh appreciation of what we need rather than what we want. A fresh understanding of your plans for our lives. A fresh outlook on what is important and simply what is not important. Father, we want to pray for the frontline medical staff who are working so hard, so desperately to keep the NHS going by offering treatment to people in need. Lord, we pray for stamina, we pray for strength and we pray for skill for those involved in caring for the sick and vulnerable. Father, we pray too for Boris Johnson and the key medical and scientific staff who are making really important decisions about how to prevent the spread of this virus and how to save lives. Father, we pray for them. We pray for wisdom and discernment and decisiveness against a wave of unknowns. Oceans roar, mountains heave, but you are God. Father God, we ask for your calm to prevail over the storm this week. We pray for your peace to fall where there is fear and trepidation. We pray for your presence to work its way into our homes where there is loneliness or discord. And as Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, I ask our Father God to strengthen you by his spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength <laughs> that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, that you will be able to take in with all the followers of Jesus, the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. During the uncertainties of this coming week, take in the extravagance of Christ's love. Reach out, experience its breath, test its length, plumb its depths, rise to its heights, live full lives, lives that are full for God's sake. Amen. We read Psalm 130 before Wally comes to preach for us. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a sin record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, 
My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. to despair And though I might fail to trust your promises You never fail to hear my prayer And if you judged my sin I'd never stand again But I see mercy in your hands So more than watchmen for the morning I will wait for you, my God And when my fears come with no warning In your word I put my trust And when the harvest time is over And I still see no fruit Mysteries belong to you We only know what you reveal And all my questions that are unresolved Don't change the wisdom of your will In every trial and loss my hope is in the cross Where your compassions never fail So more than watchmen for the morning I will wait for you, my God And when my fears come with no warning In your word I put my trust And when the hardest time is over And I still see no fruit
Good morning, Crofton Baptist. Very many thanks to Virginia, Femi, Hugh, Diane, and Tommy for all the work that went into this attempt to bring you a video experience of our Sunday morning worship. I hope you have a cup of tea and a Bible open before you, ready to learn with me from Psalm 130. My message to you this morning is titled, Waiting in Hope. Through this period of Lent, we have been doing a mini-series in the Psalms. Psalm 130 is one of the group of Psalms from 120 to 134, referred to as the Songs of Ascent. They were probably sung in those days as part of the festival procession as the Jews went up from their different homelands up the mountain to Jerusalem. We are not sure who wrote this psalm, but it is thought to have been written by David. It could also have been written by Ezra when Israel was in captivity. Whoever wrote it, there is no doubt about the fact that it comes from a place of pain and despair. The emotion of a drowning person pleading, please save me or I die. Two weeks ago, we were looking at Psalm 95, which was a song of enthronement. We learned that thanksgiving is more than feeble individual words of gratitude. Real thankfulness is mobile and passionate, and it is lived out. I used the word thanks living. It receives every good gift as grace undeserved. You might just remember the words Massa and Meribah. Last week, Chris took us on a journey to the sheep pen to meet the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd in Psalm 23 is our Lord Jesus Christ, who knows how to help us back on our feet when we have fallen over helpless. Today, we explore further. We study a psalm that seems written for today in Petwood, in the United Kingdom, or in our world, fighting an enemy that we cannot just nuke away. Opening our psalm, in verse 1, there is no question about where physically or emotionally the psalmist is or has been. It starts, out of the depths I cry out. The words used here betray the cry of a man <clears throat> drowning in the depths of water. Depths were both physical and emotional. Remember Jonah's prayer from the belly of the fish. This type of prayer is called a lament, a cry from the heart, a cry out in pain, a cry out in suffering, in the darkness of loss or bereavement, in serious betrayal or disappointment, a cry out when there might have been a diagnosis of crippling or wasting disease. A cry asking God to intervene, rescue, and show mercy. Out of the depths, I cry out to you, Yahweh God. I'm suffocating, drowning. I cannot help myself. Life is being snuffed out. I can no longer swim. I'm being overcome by strong tidal waves. 
whatever depths you may be in this morning, there is a God who knows because he has experienced it and promises you from Psalm 23 last week, surely goodness and mercy and a safe passage back home. Praise Psalm 103. I would read it as four interlinked parts. Please open it with me. Verses 1 to 2a. He looks at his circumstances. The psalmist is gasping for breath, hopeless in tears. Verses 2b to 4. He looks up at God Almighty, Yahweh God. Verses 5 to 6, he receives the comfort to wait. Wait for the Lord. Wait with Adonai. In verses 7 to 8, he's sufficiently comforted to look away from himself, to give a testimony of hope and comfort to his community. Let's repeat that again. In verse 1, he looks down carefully. He's in a mess. In verses 2 to 4, he looks up. He cries in confession and worship. In verses 5 to 6, he receives comfort to wait. Wait, wait, wait for the dawn. Verses 7 and 8, he's sharing his testimony. He invites others. He invites the nation to experience hope and comfort. Using this pattern, you can also write your lament when, it's when, not if, you find yourself in this place. Let us now look deeper into the bits of this psalm. Out of the depths, I cry out to you, Lord, hear my voice. It's not clear if this should have been translated. From the, from the original Hebrew, Hebrew, either in the present tense or the past tense. If it was translated, out of the depths I cried out to you. The change in tense would change it from a present plea to a psalm of thanksgiving. But the passion in the language and the way he invokes God's name would suggest that it is written through a period of great difficulty. Just like we have at this time in Petswood and indeed all over the world. Whatever the tense, there is mystery and affliction. That is clear. For us, in similar circumstances, it could be a mental health issue. It could be serious financial problems. It could be a loss of comfort in relationships that we have invested our lives in. It could be disappointment in people or a powerful temptation. It could be the threat of illness, what we regard as being in a shameful place, or even anxiety over coronavirus. Whatever it is, we are all afflicted, yet it is personal and has different presentation for each one of us. Today, you can write your own lament and look up to our God for hope and comfort. Right from the first verse, we notice some threads that run right through and define the core of this psalm. If you have the passage open, please count how many times he calls the name of the Lord. I have done my counting eight times in eight verses. Think of a mother who is about to complicate, uh, confiscate her son's PlayStation. 
you see real anguish. Mommy, please. Mommy, don't do this, mommy. Mommy, I'll do my homework, mommy. Mommy, no, no, mommy. Why call the name of the Lord so many times? It's an emphasis, like a child, that there is nowhere else to look but with you and in you and about you, Lord. Look, look well in your NIV. You'll notice that the word Lord is written in two different ways, in different verses in this psalm. In some verses, the word Lord is fully capitalized when they interpret from the word Yahweh in the original Hebrew. In some other verses, just the first letter L is capitalized when translating from the word Adonai. Almighty Sovereign God, Yahweh, His Holy Name, Adonai, the Lord who owns all, and can do all was an acceptable nickname for God, while the name Yahweh was regarded as too holy and should not even be said. This is a passionate cry from a weak and undeserving person to a powerful but caring and loving God. In verse 2, he cries, Yahweh, hear my voice. Adonai, let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there's forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. In verse 3, he quotes God's nature and character. He quotes the love and mercy. He quotes the love and mercy part. Note, he does not quote the judgment beat. 4,000 years ago, he was a God whose love did not keep a record of wrongs. Think about 1 Corinthians 13 1. And he has not changed, not today. Since the psalmist wrote this, we have been given a new deal, a new agreement, emphasizing, emphasizing God's love, signed and sealed in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have what the psalmist did not have. See verses 3 and 4. If you kept a record of sin, I deny who could stand but, but with you there is forgiveness. See the direction changing with the but. It stresses a variety of contrasts. I may not be able to avoid wrongdoing, but human beings, even Christian colleagues, may have a short rope, but parents, friends, colleagues at work, that I may have let down, may be exasperated by my offending. But with you, our God, in the blood of Jesus Christ, wipes the slate clean. He is a forgiving God. And when God grants forgiveness, nothing can revoke it. Nothing. The word used for forgiveness here literally means cutting off and so suggests the merciful surgery by which a cancerous tumor is taken out of the soul. Why? So we can reverence him and serve him. We are delivered for service, for worship. We are freed from the bondage of guilt and sin to worship. Our work is worship. We are freed from bondage for his name's sake. As Chris put it last week from Psalm 23, because God has bound up his reputation 
with me being saved. But while this is the nature of God, it is not the nature of man. It is in our nature to seek vindication. Our ego, which makes us thrust ourselves into the central place, which belongs to God, needs to be right. Our ego must not lose face. Remember, do not be like Massa and Meribah. Some of you would remember what those words mean from two weeks ago. The essence of lament is to be more like him. If I were more like him, my present would be different and my hope secure. Look how the key, look, look how the key words change as we go through this psalm. In verses 1 and 2, we see depth, cry, hear, mercy. Verse 4, forgiveness, forgiveness. Verses 5 and 6, it's wait, learn to wait, watch men learn to wait, wait. Contrast with 7, uh, seven and 8. Wait, hope, unfailing love, abundant redemption. See how the psalm changes from despair to hope when you take the matter up to the mountain where help resides. Something changes in verse 5. <clears throat> the guilt disappears and the lost son or daughter is absorbed back home into the fold. See how the word wait is repeated five times in verses 5 and 6. I'll read it. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits for the Lord. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Waiting on the Lord and waiting with him. Waiting is, very, is a very unpopular word now. If you're over 70 or have received one of the 1.7 million letters from the NHS that you are medically compromised, you have 12 weeks of waiting before life becomes normal again. That's why waiting is not a popular word now. Waiting periods are periods of uncertainty. We struggle with waiting because we are so used to our wealth which buys the best services for the cheapest. And we expect perfectly predictive, predictable futures and outcomes. In these unprecedented times, we are forced to wait in COVID-19 and forced quarantine in the comfort of our homes. We are an intensely privileged lot for most people hearing me today, there is no real shortage of food. Water, even wine, is available on tap. Hopes are warm. There is a doctor at the end of a phone line. And we live in a great neighborhood. Even this land is literally flowing with milk and honey. Even in these circumstances, our homes is still, waiting at home is still a relatively tough ask. We live in Mark world. Generation X holds the middle ground, but Generation Y, the millennials, is entering the stage. These guys have never had to wait for anything in their lives. The psalmist receives the word, wait. Maybe, maybe the Lord is waiting also, waiting for you and I. Might he be waiting to make you willing and ready for the change you seek? Perhaps the Lord is waiting for you to slow down from your speed in the wrong direction. 
to shift your gaze where he's looking. Don't make him wait too long. Perhaps this waiting time is a great opportunity to rearm ourselves with the word so we can come out at the other end knowing our God better. Be stronger for each other, stronger for our families, and stronger for our nation. God means this for good, for the good of his children, for the good of his church. How do we wait? How do we wait? There are two types of waiting. I refer back again to Psalm 95, which tells us how not to wait. Do not wait in quarrel and testing of God. Psalm 130, in verses 7 and 8, tell us how to wait. Wait in hope. Wait in worship. Wait in thanks living. Verse 7 says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Crofton Baptist, put your hope in the Lord, not in man, not in government, not in doctors, but in the Lord. The word used here is Yahweh. For with the Lord I deny his unfailing love. The psalmist is crying, pleading, invoking the Lord by his names. He's invoking the Lord by his character and his promises to his children. As we stand in the gap for our nation, we pray. We pray out of the depths. I, and you can put your name here, out of the depths, I will cry to you, Lord, Lord, hear my voice. And God responds, he says, wait. Crofton Baptist UK, wait. Put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption, full redemption, abundant redemption. He himself will redeem our country from all our sins and affliction. The psalmist addresses Israel. The present day Israel is the people of God, those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. Those who have had a glimpse of that place of full joy and live today waiting in that joy of salvation. And talking about those who can earnestly pray, come again, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, come. I am part of that new Israel. Are you? Come, Lord. Come and take over the government of the nations. Come, Lord Jesus, come again. See, the psalm goes. I see how the psalm goes. I cry out and confess. He forgives. I wait and receive. I testify of his glory. Four parts. How often we stop at the third stage, having credited our deliverance elsewhere. Mothers, fathers, grandparents, this is the time to pray and love our children and grandchildren back home. It's the time for the prodigals to step back into the love of the Father who is always waiting, arms open, waiting for them to come back home. Are you listening to me this morning and you have, ne you have not never felt that joy of knowing salvation? Did you proclaim love for Jesus Christ once? And you are now not so sure. 
Do not be afraid of the disease that wastes at noonday. The world stands today looking for water rather than the well. We look for the healing rather than seek to meet the healer. He's right here, today, wherever you are. Wherever you are listening to me, he's here offering more than protection from COVID-19, which can kill the body, but has not power over the soul. Don't let today pass you by. Ask Jesus to be your friend today. Tomorrow might be too late. The Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. My soul, your souls, our soul communicates with God on a different level. It communicates with its maker who can protect both body and soul. Let's take the focus away from Corona today and use this valuable waiting time to focus on our maker and make him Lord, make him Yahweh. I ask you, people of God, write your own laments today. I wait to hear your testimony. Remember, wait in hope. Write your lament to him. Again, see the format in this psalm. I confess my need. My need. He forgives. I wait and receive. I testify to his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray together. It's a short prayer. Father, I pray for anyone listening to me today who is petrified about the state of our world. Please, may they find peace from you to wait in hope. Please, Lord, change our anxiety to a joyful wait for your second coming. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we come to the end of our service, we pray together. Out of the depths we cry to you, O Lord our God. In every trial and loss, our hope is in the cross, where your compassions never fail. Father God, hold us now in your hand as we enter another week of uncertainty and unknown. As we go through this coming week, our desire is that we will soar with you over the storms of life. Help us to be the light on the city, on the hill, to those around us. Go with us, hold us safely in your hands, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.